Qianlong was crowned the new emperor in the year Castiglione was 47 years old. Unlike his father, who had a reputation of being careful and reserved, the young emperor was only 24 years old and filled with joie de vivre, and had a famous taste for literature and art. According to the emperor's journalists, for his service to the crown, the Italian painter was awarded a half kilo of ginseng, two pieces of mink fur, and a number of other precious fabrics twice that year, surpassing other court painters to become the empire's top rank artist. It took him nearly 20 years of dutiful service to the royal family. Now he spoke and wrote in Chinese with remarkable fluency and had a comprehensive knowledge of how things worked in the empire. Everything his Catholic Church had sent him here for 20 years ago, now he had it, or more than it. And yet, as always, he was not only a man of God, but also a man of royal duties. The young emperor now would like portraits to be painted of himself and his favorite wives and concubines well, call them a dozen. Chen Long Emperor in court dress was painted when the subject was 25 years of age. Regally seated in his imperial throne, the emperor appears in a serene demeanor. The demeanor of a young man who was raised with a purpose to govern and rule, with a careful childhood education and the upbringing under influences of powerful men in all capacities. And this day it came the time that he was finally to seize upon the scepter. The age of the new ruler was unfolding. It was perhaps also the first time a Chinese ruler appeared in a picture to be realistically comprehensible, rather than figurative like his predecessors, such as this Emperor Nua Hachi, his great-great-grandfather who was portrayed to be seated in an equally intricate throne but with a slightly vague expression on his face. The business of portraiture had always been among the most challenging in the art of painting. And among the difficult portraits, the most challenging of them all was for the sitter to be facing up front. That way, all the facial attributes became indistinguishable. In the Chinese portraitist situation, on top of all the challenges, he was forbidden from applying chiaroscuro. That had been the kind of situation Castiglione found himself in. All emperors, kings and popes wanted their portraits made while in power, regardless of the West or the East. Sir Anthony van Dyck, a Belgian, spent half his life painting kings and lords in the English court and was to a certain extent to shape the style how aristocratic portraits were to be made in Europe. Lucky for Van Dyck, he had a great deal more freedom to determine what gesture his subject was to take and what techniques he would engage, such as in his Charles I at the Hunt. In the picture, the English king only offered a nonchalant glimpse towards the painter, as if he was called upon for a second's attention while standing gazing at a direction perpendicular to the painter. His entourage, each busy with his own business, were not necessarily so attentive to the monarch as we would have expected. What could be appalling to the Chinese aristocracy had they ever seen this picture was that half the canvas was covered with chiaroscuro, the dark shade they disapproved so vehemently. It should be reasonable to anticipate that no Chinese court painter would go so far as to suggest the emperor be painted of a glimpse showing half his face and the other half obscured in shade, the so-called in young face by the Qing court. Such is to exemplify the rigidity of life in the Oriental Empire in comparison to the English court, even under its most notoriously tyrannical king who was later to be executed by his own parliament for being too power-thirsty. From a Chinese point of view, one could only say that 
the English people were simply too unforgiving to their monarch. Castiglione must have endured ordeals to paint the emperor in that posture. Face up front, no smile, no anger, nothing at all, but the coolest composure of a self-asserted man. However, Charles I did have a frontal face painted by Van Dyck too. Front, left side and right side, all meticulously scrutinized on the same canvas for the purpose of being sent to Italy for a bust to be made by the genius sculptor Bernini. In the frontal face, Van Dyck had light coming to a slight angle from the left so as to produce shade of facial features and make them distinguishable. Unlike in Emperor Qianlong's picture, light came up right from the front so that all attributes were perfectly lit, leaving no room for chiaroscuro. A very unique experience for a portraitist, I suppose. Paintings in the West were often made of oil or tempera on canvas, whereas in China, they were made of tempera or ink on silk or ink paper. Very rare for an oil painting to be found in China those days. One famous oil painting was of the noble consort Hui Xian, one of the emperor's favorite women, painted by Castiglione. It might be due to the artist's more experienced hand after many portraits as this piece was done a year later than the one of the emperor. Or it might be just that the artist simply found oil more handy in painting portraits. This picture of the imperial consort is considerably more acceptable to an European eye of the connoisseur. The lady appears in a ceremonial dress of the Manchurian fashion. The contour of the human figure it's extraordinarily neat and nimble, rendering the picture so clean and soothing. Perhaps that's what an imperial consort was meant to be. As the painter's seniority grew by the year, a crowd of disciples and assistants started to gather around him. Year by year, a certain kind of Castiglione school of painters was taking shape within the Qing court. The master, tired of years of toil and weakened by old age, was never seen again to have completed a large-scale painting single-handed. His name, Lang Shining, would from then on appear on the corners of court paintings followed by names of Chinese artists who were obviously his disciples or assistants. <laughs> 